Certainly no stranger to Teal, Dr. Matt Morgan, Associate Professor of Philosophy, has been at Teal for nine years. In addition to teaching, Dr. Morgan is also the director of the Study Abroad, Study Away program, and in that capacity has initiated efforts that have been very successful, one of which is the current British Life and Culture series for students who will go to London and France this summer. Last May, he and some students toured Greece. Dr. Morgan's presentation today will focus on that excursion and on how study tours may satisfy the practicum component of the new core. I'm proud to present my colleague, Dr. Morgan. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Hall. I appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you spending your Thursday afternoon on an April when time is running short for all sorts of endeavors for you. I really appreciate you coming along and uh, maybe transitioning from an American odyssey to a odyssey of a different sort. <laughs> Greece. Um, on our trip to Greece last May, uh, we had Ryan Hart, Sarah Matzak, Rachel Hutchinson, Melody Zuniga, Sean Oros, Xavier Walker, Hannah Teagle, and myself. A couple of those people are present here, so if at any time, Ryan or Sean, you have anything to add, please feel free to just speak up, raise your hand, and jump right in, okay? I'd like to begin uh, this presentation with a delightful poem that we heard on the third day in Athens, one that kind of struck me to the core, even though I'd never heard of this fellow before, uh, maybe shame on me for that, but um, you know, it's a poem of relatively recent vintage, less than 100 years old, almost about 100 years old at this point, point. and so maybe I'll just recite this for you. As you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery, Lastragonians and Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way, as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lastragonians and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope the voyage is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when, with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbor seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to gather stores of knowledge from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But do not hurry the journey at all. Better it lasts for years, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey, Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will give, become so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. Hmm. Well, Ithaca is obviously a reference to uh, the Odyssey by Homer. Um, but what else do we find represented in this use of the term Ithaca? What else does it represent for us? A destination or a finish? A goal, a destination, some place you hope to wind up. Well, where do you hope to wind up today? Many of us delight in returning home. Many of us just got back from Easter vacation, where I hope many of you had the opportunity to return to your loved ones, to have a sense of home, a sense of identity, a sense of, well, that sort of warm feeling that you get when you walk in the front door. Ithaca is home for all of us, 
It was home for Odysseus. It's home for us. It's Greece. I mean, when I first started thinking about bringing a group of students to Greece, what I had in mind was an honors class that I had done several years back that focused on the Greek roots of our Western identity. And in an interdisciplinary fashion, we sort of began looking at both art and music, such as we had it, uh, poetry, of politics. So many of the things that we find around us, and an answer to the why should we care about Greece, um, so many of the things find their roots in a Greek identity, and so it seems that Ithaca is Greece in many ways. Ithaca is the West's home. It's where the West began at least to be considered West as opposed to, say, Persian. So, um, I think that this poem is a delightful one, and I, I, I find interest in this last set of lines. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Well, in the one sense, when we went to Greece, one of the first things that was apparent was that Athens is kind of this city that has a past. In the good and the bad sense, it has a past. It has a past that sometimes might seem like a bit of an albatross around its neck. It's a, it's a city that is visited primarily for the Acropolis, primarily for ancient Greece, not for what it is today. Um, many Athenians live there. Of course, it's a city of five million people. But as we might know if we've been listening to world affairs recently, Greece is back on her heels again. She's poor. She is probably one of the least affluent in the European Union. And so when we disembarked from the plane, many of us uh, got this sense of, first, wow, this is a really, really big city, and we're from Greenville, and that alone is a bit of a shock. But we also noticed how, well, unkempt her appearance might be. There was a lot of graffiti. There was a lot of works in progress. There were some shiny places that were new and modern as a result of the Olympics that were recently held there, um, primarily. But, you know, I mean, one thing that just really can't escape your notice is the abundance of sex shops and the abundance of graffiti everywhere you look. And one of the first things that we were told when we came to Greece, when we disembarked and met our tour director, was an interesting problem with Athenian plumbing. Does anybody know the problem with Athenian plumbing? Well, we're familiar with you know our, our, our commodious latrines. I once had a professor who said, you know, he seemed like he was always down on America a lot. And, and one of the students said, well, what does America really do good? And he said, we do good toilets. <laughs> <laughs> the Athenians do not. <laughs> they are stuck with a plumbing system that is about an inch too small in terms of its the amount that it needs to carry. And so one of the things we immediately had to get used to was uh, discarding our paper products, all of our paper products, in a waste basket as opposed to our usual location for them. Which was just a little awkward to have that just smack you right in the middle of the face as soon as you come down to Athens. You've got to be careful how you use our toilets. <laughs> okay. Now, I mean, in terms of a modern city, like I said, it's got five million people. And I think the order of our tour, in retrospect, was meant to reflect the idea that Athens is a modern city. It's a city that's here today and also has a tremendous past. So the first place that we visited was the market district where you can buy all the tchotchkes that you need. And luckily we returned there right before we left. 
because, of course, I was just wandering around. Uh, all of a sudden, oh, I don't have anything for anybody back home. I better pick something up. Uh, so, you know, one of the things my wife wanted was these little slippers with the pom-poms on it. Might have seen these. That was kind of fun place you could pick those up. But it was a live, bustling market. Now, what are markets called in ancient Greece? The Agora. What's my connection to going to ancient Greece? I'm a philosopher. Where did Socrates hang out? Was it in a university? No. He hung out at the mall, essentially. <laughs> he was a mall rat. He was a troublemaker in the mall. In the Agora. And the Plaka, this market district that's active in Athens, is the first place we visit. And it's still going strong. It's still bustling with the activity of bargaining. Greece is a place you bargain. Um, and then our next visit was the Roman Agora. Roman Agora? Wait, we're in Greece. But yeah, the Roman ruins are extensive in Athens and quite beautiful. I remember the Tower of the Four Winds. And then, of course, we also remember the sort of marketplace latrines. It's kind of interesting. They had this good plumbing back then, not so good today. <laughs> And then finally, at the end, we visited Athens' ancient Agora, where indeed Socrates had spent his time. So, we took a nice tour. Of course, we visited the Acropolis, that is the highlight of Athens. And in fact, they've mandated that no building should be so tall as to impede the view of the Acropolis, which is really amazing, especially at night. Lit up as it is. Um, just Really, you know, even in its pilfered state, thanks to the British, we're now going to actually see the beautiful statues this May that were taken from Greece that we visited last May. Um, but of course, the Parthenon is the beautiful, beautiful temple ruins that you can go walk around. The Porch of the Maidens, we see a little uh, indication of that with the caryatids and the sculpted ladies holding up the porch when I favorite places there. So Athens is not just ancient. Athens is a live, vibrant place. And when you go on travels, oftentimes you're surprised by the things that are totally unplanned that you run across that are really emblematic of the culture. You want to go and visit not just the places, but the people. And I think one of these things happened when we ran across the festival of St. Constantine and Helen, his mother. They combined the two, and they held a several-day festival honoring these saints, bringing out the Greek icons in Greek Orthodoxy. There are the images, and they brought out the images outside of the church with a large <coughs> formal procession. Candles lit all around them, people lining up to kiss the icons. Uh, really, essentially, living religion, not the religion that we're going to be mostly focused on looking for these ancient ruins that Greece is so well known for. And so this is the church that the festival is centered around, the church of uh, St. Constantine and Helen in the outskirts of Athens where we were staying. This is kind of a bit of grainy nighttime image of that procession that we saw uh, walking down the streets. I, I love how there's the, these formal robes and everything juxtaposed with their sneakers on, the, on their feet, you know. It was kind of, you know, it reminds me of the, the they had a, a police procession going on for it as well. And the police were just kind of like, you know, yep, yeah, we're here. Not really martial and formal. It's kind of a bit relaxed. And that, too, is indicative of Mediterranean culture, I think, especially. After that, we took a daytime cruise. We went to Hydra. I know I just really wanted to say Hydra, but it's Hydra, I guess. Hydra, Poros, and Aegina. Um, Hydra was this small island, the Saronic Islands uh, in the Gulf. And um, it really sort of represented that classic vision of Greece as that whitewashed mountain town 
with a little bit of glue here and there on the tiles. Uh, it, in some ways, was made to fit the bill, I think. They outlawed cars. And when you got off the, the ferry boat, uh, you're immediately struck by the, the offers of donkey rides. You can enjoy the, you know, the full donkey ride experience. Essentially, the grease that you get from Hollywood. right? The uh, Zorba the Greek grease. The Mamma Mia grease. That uh, many people are after if they're not after the Greek ancient ruins. Uh, on the island of Aegina, they had one of these temple ruins that were far less touristy. We could actually wander around a bit more on this uh, hilltop temple that uh, is nowhere near a major metropolitan center like the Acropolis, and is part of this triangle of temples that exists in Athens, just outside of Athens, with the Temple of Poseidon, the Parthenon, and then this Temple of Athea, dedicated to a maiden who, in trying to escape from some sailors, miraculously disappeared into the thin air. One additional feature that I remember from this point of the trip, and I don't know if you guys remember this one or not, but uh, we in this, in this group were paired up with other universities, which was nice. It was an opportunity to get to know people from elsewhere, and this group was, the largest group was from Arkansas or Alabama? Arkansas. Arkansas. And there was this one especially loquacious guy who was, you know, kind of fun, and, and he literally missed the boat. <laughs> The boat was leaving, people were going, where's so-and-so, where's so-and-so, he's not on the boat. And he missed the boat. Now, you know, as, as a faculty advisor for such a tour, I would be in conniptions. I would be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Uh, but our tour director was fairly calm about it and confident. And, you know, lo and behold, these, these, this guy who missed the boat was in fact able to find his way back to Athens by the time our cruise was over and we met, and it was a happy ending. And one of the things that studying abroad really, really has a chance to develop in young souls is this sense of confidence that, you know, if a mishap happens, you can figure things out on your own. You can get back to where you need to go on your own. It is doable, even in a foreign land where you don't speak Greek. On the boat, it was a little campy, and we had we had the traditional Greek dancer performance type thing go on here. And uh, you know, this is the again a bit of the Hollywoodization that we find when people go to Greece. They're trying to look for the traditional Greece, uh, and this sort of fits that bill for folks. And it was kind of kind of fun, kind of a little. Eh, this isn't really the way Greeks really live today. Beautiful picture from the group, you know, just the striking colors and Hydra in the distance. There is sort of again this whitewashed set of buildings, uh, really sort of sitting pretty. And then we were off to Delphi. Um, Delphi is this temple complex that was revered for a thousand years in antiquity. People would come from not just the various policies of Greece, but from outside of Greece as well to consult with the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, this priestess called the Pythia. Um, the Pythia, when asked questions, would respond enigmatically, setting up a sort of cottage industry of male priests who would interpret what the woman really meant. Hmm, sound familiar? <laughs> Maybe, um, but you know these were riddles. This was a this was real sort of key business, and in order to jump to the front of the line in terms of asking the oracle your question, you have to pay a little bit, and so much of the temple complex is dedicated to these treasuries where various people from Athens would plump down their large amounts of money or goods or sculptures or what have you. So they could really, because usually when you go to ask an oracle a question, it's a pressing question. You want to know the answer. 
So, you know, if you can, you plunk down what you can, you skip to the front of the line, you ask the question, and she replies with something totally confusing. You know, kind of like when you ask the professor some question. <laughs> it really wasn't what I was asking, but okay. <laughs> and off you go asking your friends, what did he mean? <laughs> Another aspect of the Delphic Oracle that I really, really appreciate are these, these sayings that are over the gates of the temple. Uh, know thyself, very fundamental for Socrates, uh, the project of knowing thyself. And Aristotle's favorite, nothing in excess, the golden mean. Sort of pithy words to live by, I suppose. But, you know, appropriate, the Oracle of Delphi. Set in this very mountainous region. I mean, it's very dramatic geographically. I don't think you could have had the Oracle at Delphi be as successful if it were just in some mundane field somewhere. It's like, okay, we're going to set up a little temple here. We're going to say, y'all come and ask some questions in this great priestess will answer them. And uh, you, you need the cooperation of geography to really sort of set the stage, the tone. And as people would come up in antiquity by foot or by horse, you know, by ox cart or what have you, this is a very dramatic cliffs, and it's just really set into the cliffside there. So if you ever get a chance, it's, it's a beautiful place to go visit, just for the, for the remarkable scenery, if nothing else. One thing that we notice that in all of these complexes, there is sort of a set of um, institutional architecture, for lack of a better term. There is, of course, the temples. And that gets most people's attention. But there are also amphitheaters. Were they set plays at our religion? Well, anybody go see a passion play? They still do this, right? But you know, going to these plays, these tragedies of ancient Greece, Oedipus, and all that, it really was a religious experience, as was athletic competition. Right? At all of these places, you also had stadium, and stadium are places for foot races. This is an unremarkable conical stone. What the heck is that? Well, it's actually Middle Earth. <laughs> um, Zeus sent out two eagles, so the myth goes, and when they came back together, that was the center of the world. So literally, for the Greeks, this was the navel of the world. And they set them place with a, you know, sort of appropriate looking. There are some fancier ones in but the, the center of the earth, Middle Earth. And if you ever wondered why Mediterranean Ocean is called the Mediterranean, Med means middle. You know, great civilizations have a tendency to perhaps arrogantly think they're at the center of the world. Next, we went and visited Olympia, a beautiful place, enormous, large complex, archaeologically speaking. Uh, and yes, this is the place where the Olympics are from. This is the place where every four years, Ancient Greeks would get together and see who's the fastest, who can wrestle the best, who can box the best, who can you know, run the chariots the fastest. And while you might think that the ancient Greek Olympics were sort of like, you know, just for the Greeks, this continued long into the Roman era. And of course, when we went to the stadium, still in existence, this plot of land where people are to uh, race on foot. I had to drop the gauntlet and challenge my students. Let's race. <laughs> and of course, I lost. <laughs> Completely. Everyone was in front of me. But we did try and go au naturel, too, as, as the Greeks would have done, at least with our feet. Because if you know anything about the ancient Greeks and how they exercise, or you know the root of the word gymnasium, you know that they love to do everything naked. So naked foot racing was probably going to get us in trouble. We just took off our shoes and did that. But we also got in trouble for that. So, you know, perhaps putting them at an insurance risk. I was the only student to yell at that for running barefoot. Rumors circulating you, you this guilty ball for that for the rest of the day. Oh my gosh. But it was, it was fun. It was probably one of my most favorite points of the whole experience. Losing to all my students. <laughs> the staff would pop out of bushes and catch the <laughs> They've got their eyes on you. Don't mess with the archaeology here. 
here's an entrance, and uh, you know, one of the students who's not here, Sarah Matzak, sent me her favorite moments, and her favorite moment was at Olympia as well. And what she noted was that every winner and every cheater caught <laughs> was given a statue. On one side you have the victors, and on the other side you have the cheaters, the losers, who were similarly immortalized. I think we should adopt that policy at Tia. What do you think? <laughs> Get a little picture of all of shame, maybe. I don't know. People think twice before plagiarizing anything. <laughs> and here's our victor, Xavier Walker. He was the, the fastest among us. And so I had him sit down on one of these pedestals where the ancient statues used to be of these victors. It is also said that Phidias, the famous sculptor, had his workshop just outside of uh, the Olympia complex. This is Palmyde Castle. Nothing ancient Greek about it particularly. It was built during the Ottoman conflicts, uh, which raged over ancient Greece. The Ottomans imposed their rule on Greece for a long, long time. Uh, and during a moment of independence, Greece decided to really fortify this one place they called their capital for a while. Uh, Palmyde Castle. And the only way up was this long, twisty, windy staircase that almost gave me a heart attack. But evidently the other students who were younger than me were also having a hard time getting up there. It was just really, really high up. You were talking about how important the high ground is, you know, for artillery. They were using artillery back then, and this was really high ground. You want to talk about a field to shoot your cannon off of. You got that at all the naval forces that might attack. Uh, Epidaurus, this is a complex again where uh, the people would go for many, many years to heal. Asclepius uh, is honored here. And again, we have this repetition the amphitheater, the stadium, and the temple complex. Probably the best amphitheater that's ancient and still in use occasionally. I guess they held a concert there about a year or two before. I think the last real kind of key place of note that we visited was Mycenae. And so here we're going back from the Hellenic period, a little bit further to this Mycenaean uh, era, where we have uh, Agamemnon, perhaps, and his brother, and the Trojan War. Really, as far as uh, archaeology goes, not a whole heck of a lot going on. It's a hill, fortified hill town. Uh, but one of the most iconic pieces of architecture of all of Greece, the Lion's Gate, was there. And so I took that as a great opportunity to get us all together for a group shot. And uh, also some beehive tombs. We were able to go inside. Cameras don't do a very good job of representing the sort of scale of the beehive tombs where they bury their famous people from. Um, it was kind of a, a delightful place to go romp around. And last, on our way back into Athens, we caught sight of this uh, Corinthian canal that I guess had actually been uh, attempted in Roman era first, first. Think of the amount of work those sheer cliffs would have taken to you know, dig out. It's just, I mean, just you look down and you go, wow, well, that's, that's pretty far down. <laughs> I mean, it really wasn't that much more significant than that, but it was just kind of an interesting place to stop and take a gander. Uh, lastly, at the last day of Athens, we wandered about the Agora, as I had said, and saw the Temple of Hephaestus, uh, most complete temple of ancient, ancient Greece left there. Um, and then just to conclude this presentation, we've got a, a promontory, a hilltop promontory, where we all climbed up on an island cruise, and we took various turns of getting our, our pictures next to the Greek flag. Thank you, Ryan, for being our model there. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate all of your time listening to our Greek Odyssey.